Well, today we're going to be talking about something that is a threat, a problem for each one of us, but an opportunity for each one of us. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, in, in that chapter, Paul the Apostle is talking about something that we all need to be vigilant about, not to be uh, proud of ourselves, not to think we're so great, uh, because we will fall if we think we are strong. But instead, we need to be vigilant about something very important. And what is that? You need to be vigilant about, anybody know what the answer is? Temptation. Temptation. Is there anyone in this room who has never been tempted to sin before? Just kind of curious. Anybody watching online? I'm probably all tempted. So we're going to introduce uh, this issue as we prepare to turn to God's Word today. Now, the Apostle Paul goes on to say, and you can follow this in your notes, that God will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. So if you tell me, well, I'm not tempted very much, then it may well be that God doesn't think you have great ability to withstand temptation. So he's not laying it on you pretty heavily, not allowing you to be tempted beyond uh, your ability. So uh, God, in fact, the apostle says, will provide the way of escape so that you may endure it. In other words, in every temptation, there is a way of escape that God provides. You do not have to sin, and certainly, if you are born anew in the Holy Spirit, God gives you power by his Holy Spirit and specifically by his word to know the way to escape the temptation without sinning. Now, in uh, James chapter 4, verses 5 through 7, we referred to this uh, generally in our study on Wednesday night on the issue of the jealousy of God for our salvation and for his people. We talked about the fact that Oprah Winfrey rejected her Baptist upbringing in traditional Christian faith because she didn't like the concept of God being jealous and really didn't understand, as we saw from the clip we provided, what that meant in the first place. But, but here we get it again. Or do you suppose that it is to no purpose that the scripture says he, that is God, yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. In other words, if God has saved you and filled you with his spirit, he wants to protect you in his Holy Spirit. He's jealous for you. He doesn't want you to go prostituting your soul to Satan or forces of evil. Okay? He's jealous. But, but he gives more grace. Now notice this. He gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud. Oh, I'm, I'm, I got this handled, man. Or I'm, I'm really smart. I can, now, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So then what are we supposed to do? The next verse tells us in James chapter 4, verse 7. Do two things. Notice the verbs here. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Submit to God, okay? Humbly submit to God. And resist, powerfully resist in that submission to God, the devil. And he will flee from you as you submit to God. What does it mean to submit to God? Well, it means to live a life walking according to God's plan, not my plan. And that includes being heavily into God's word. I, I pity people who, who say they are Christian but do not follow a regular daily discipline of Bible study, who are not involved in our Bible studies here as the gathered congregation, who just kind of like randomly occasionally show up to worship or say a, a prayer in case somebody gets sick, but otherwise they're just kind of floating through life. This would be the equivalent of having, let's say in, in 1943, showing up in France uh, with a big resistance t-shirt on totally unarmed, foolish, by yourself, and walking up to some Gestapo uh, officers and, <laughs> and saying, hey, I'm here to fight you guys. Unarmed, stupid, uninformed. This is, this is the equivalent, this is analogous to being a Christian because you're on the team, you're on the team of Jesus that is at war, and understand me, is at war with the devil and the forces of evil in the world. And so what the scripture teaches us is that we need to be armed in the scripture. 
What does the Apostle Paul say is the sword of the Spirit? What's the key armament, the offensive armament you need as a Christian? The Word of God. So I, I pity people, and there, there are all kinds of people that tell me, well, you know, the Bible is complicated. I don't have time for that. I basically just got the nutshell. God loves me. It's all cool. This, this is the equivalent of somebody showing up in front of tanks and saying, here, I'm an idiot. Take me out, please. So the Bible teaches us that we need to be grounded in the Word. And this does not mean simply, as we're going to see with Jesus, Oh, I learned five Bible verses, and I can just pop them out in case I ever have to deal with the devil. This means knowing the Scripture, the flow of Scripture, and all the story and the message of the Gospel. So we're going to be turning to that today as we open God's Word. We are continuing to work our way through Luke's Gospel. We have a lot of reading from Luke, from the close of Luke chapter 3 into Luke chapter 4. But we're going to begin um, with the first Adam with the first Adam, who is God's representative on earth, representing God's dominion. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, and then chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Hear now God's word. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Now remember, you've heard me say this a number of times before, those two verbs are the same verbs as what the Levitical priests are supposed to do with respect to serving and guarding the tabernacle and later the temple to keep all uncleanness out, to keep it holy. It's Adam's job. Nothing unclean, including a serpent, is ever supposed to get into the garden. Adam is supposed to serve it and guard it and keep it. Okay, that's what we just heard. Now, let's keep reading. Um, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Mote, mote, die, die. You're, you're definitely going to die. Now then, let's go to uh, chapter 3. Now the serpent. Out of the blue, we got a serpent in here, and he's in the garden. <laughs> now, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He's a creature. He's not another God. He's a creature. Okay? He said to the woman, did God actually say, he's going to the word of God here, attacking the word of God, did, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Come on, we're more sophisticated than that. And, and the woman said to the servant, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Now notice, of course, she's adding on words, her own interpretation. She's not sticking with what God simply said. She's in dialogue now with the serpent. The serpent continued to dialogue and said to the woman, uh, you will not surely die, mo mo for, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you yourself will be like God yourself, knowing good and evil. You'll be the boss. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate. Now over to Luke chapter 3, closing segment of Luke chapter 3, and on to Luke chapter 4. Pick up where we had the great climax last week with verses 21 and 22, and then reading onward. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized, he's already baptized, and was praying, submitting himself to God, the heavens were opened. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. Now, the genealogy of, of Jesus Christ 
humorous note here for a moment. Reed asked me a few weeks ago when I was getting ready to go to the Mexico trip, he said, are you going to make me preach the genealogy? And I said, no, we'll, we'll cover it later. But anyway, he was happy to do it if he needed to. But all right, let's do the genealogy, and then we're on to chapter 4. Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Mathath, the son of Le Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of uh, Janai, the son of uh, Joseph, the son of Mattathias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of El Esli, the son of Nagai, uh, the son of Maat, the son of Mattathias, the son of Samayain, uh, the son of Joseph, the son of Yoda, the son of Yohanan, the son of Resha, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adi, the son of Kassam, the son of El Madan, the son of Er, the son of Joshua, the son of Eleazar, the son of Jorim, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonam, the son of Eliakim, the son of Meleah, the son of Minah, the son of uh, Mathatha, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salah, the son of Nashon, the son of Abinadab, the son of Admin, the son of Arni, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, or Yitzhak, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Serug, the son of Reu, the son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Kainan, the son of Arpatzad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamach, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mathahelel, the Elil, the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, command the stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment in time. In other words, in one flash, all across history. And said to him, to you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and, and I will give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. So we'll brush through big, big sequence of scriptures here, brush through it a little bit. Uh, let's get the settings, the, the totally opposite end of the spectrum <laughs> settings here. Adam and Eve, you know, created without sin, total choice. Uh, they are in where? Where are they? Are they in a gang-infested ghetto? Are they, you know, uh, being raised by abusive parents somewhere? Is that where they are? Are they out in the middle of nowhere? No, where are they? They are in paradise. The Garden of Eden, not just Eden, but the Garden of Eden. Uh, contrast that with Jesus. Where is Jesus going to be tempted? 
Where is he going to be tested? Jesus is not in any garden. He's not in a garden full of food with all the choices possible before him. He is in the where? The wilderness. The waste land. The wild place. The desert. No rule. No sheriff in town. No nothing. I mean, this is, this is not just the wild west. This is the wild desert. This is rough stuff. With no resources at all. That's where Jesus is going to be tempted. So just remember that. Jesus is in the wilderness, but Jesus is led by the Spirit. Luke chapter 4 opens and tells us he's led by the Spirit. Now, that's both good news and challenging news. He's led by the Spirit. That's good. But it also reminds us if you are a Christian, the level of temptation and testing you will face is infinitely greater than a non believer. And in fact, God Himself by his spirit, will lead you in seasons of testing. Now, this is fine-tuning here, but understand, same word, different emphasis here. God tests us to prove us and to strengthen us in saving faith. The devil tests us to bring us down. Think about the good professor and the evil professor, right? <laughs> or think about maybe you're presenting your thesis and there's, there's your advisor and maybe another nice person who wants you to succeed. And so they're asking you testing questions, but they're trying to lead you on to the right answers. And then maybe there's the evil guy or gal who wants you to fail. And so when she's asking questions or he's asking questions, it's to have you stumble. You get the difference, right? But God, in fact, leads us through seasons of testing, challenges to our faith, challenges in our relationships, illnesses, other you know, challenges in world situation that we might be found faithful and grow in faith. In other words, God's glory triumphs in us. Now, Jesus is led by the Spirit, and here in the desert, led by the Spirit, this is really important, the Holy Spirit has descended upon Jesus in apparent form, in bodily form, because Jesus here in the desert is the sun and sun. I've got, I got it for you in your notes. It's capital S and lowercase s. Am I being redundant there? No, I'm not at all. I'm talking about the hypostatic union. If you want to do high theology, I'm talking about the Chalcedonian formula. Jesus is fully God, but also fully human. He's fully human. So he is the fully God and fully man or human. And you have to understand this. Jesus is submitting as the incarnate son of God, the incarnate son of God, to go through his life and his testing and his public ministry from this point all the way through the cross, fully human. He does not call in superpowers of his own self. Okay, that's the, the, the way this is going to work. So, uh, back to the framing of Luke chapter 2. You're supposed to catch this. Let me highlight it for you. Luke chapter 3, verse 22. The father says, you are my son, the beloved. Now, yes, the father is saying Jesus is the servant. We talked about this in the sermon last week of Isaiah 42 through 53. Okay. Yes, God is saying you are the Mashiach, the Messiah, the promised king of Psalm 2. Yes, he's saying all that, but it's clear also here when heaven is ripped open <laughs> and the voice comes that God is acknowledging Jesus as the divine son. Jesus is the capital S son. He is the son of God. That's Luke 3.22. But then we get this odd genealogy that you all just really enjoyed as I was reading through, I know. Well, what, what is going on here? Well, we are being reminded that Jesus is also fully human all the way back down to now that chapter ends, right? You are my son, the beloved, 22, right? Verse 38, we end up with Jesus also being like Adam, okay? Human being on earth. 
And not going to spend a lot of time on the genealogy today. Sorry to disappoint you. I can do sermons galore on this if you really want it. Let me just highlight a couple things. First of all, notice that the genealogy is not your typical patrilineal genealogy. It's not begot or fathered language, which you're more used to in the Bible, right? Father, 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 father of, father of, father of. It's also not matrilineal. It's not talking about, and she conceived, and she conceived this one, okay? It's neither patrilineal nor matrilineal. It's about sonship. Do you catch what I'm saying? In other words, we've had God say, you are my son, the beloved. That's verse 22. And then we go through an entire genealogy that keeps talking about the son of, the son of, the son of. The son of, the son of, the son of. All the way to the final son of Adam, son of God. Got it? So we are being told we're dealing with the second or the last Adam, as Paul calls it. I'll come back to that. Um, we're talking about the son of line. But remember now, Jesus is conceived by the Holy Spirit. So he is not, the, the sin of Adam is not imputed to him. Go back to my earlier sermon weeks ago on that, okay? But, but he is in this human line, okay? All the way back to Adam. Let me just point out a couple things briefly on the genealogy. Notice, in case you weren't counting as I was reading through, that from Jesus to Shealtiel, okay, the first man from the exile, there are three times seven. Did you catch that? There are three times seven. Notice also on the other side of this genealogy, from Abraham all the way back to the creator and Adam, there are three times seven. That's not by accident. If you know Bible numbers, that is not by accident. We're being told there's an entire time structure and prophetic structure going on with that genealogy. Most of you probably got that as I was reading through, but I just want to remind you of what you heard as I read through the genealogy. Pretty interesting stuff, but let's move on. Um, Jesus is, as we've said already, fully God. But Jesus is also fully man, fully human. And in his humanity, Jesus, Yes, he's God the Son, but he's incarnate. He is the new and the last what? I've already introduced this concept to you. He is the new, the final, Adam. Just let me give you a hint. Go with Jesus' team. Don't go with Adam's team. Not, not a good choice to go with Adam's. Go with Jesus, okay? He's the second, the last, the new Adam. The New Testament uses all those terms about who Jesus is. Paul talks about this a lot in Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15, etc. Okay. Jesus, God the Son incarnate, fully human, is our, now catch this, he is our champion. He's our champion. He's our savior king. Remember how David took on Goliath? The giant who was in the serpentine armor, like representing the devil. Remember how his armor is serpentine? Okay. D David is the guy who says, I'm, I'm going to be the champion. Goliath's like, who's your champion? And David stands up. Nobody else will. Okay, that's just a little prophetic foretaste of who Jesus is for us. He is our champion. He's our archegos. He's our savior king. He takes on the devil. He takes on the devil. He takes on evil. He takes on sin and death. I mean, he's awesome. But he's also, now catch this. So he's not only the Savior King, he's also the Savior Priest for you, Christian, for us. So he is our mediator, okay? He's also our something else. Is he for us or against us? What do you think? He's your advocate. He's like when it's kind of down to the wire, is the dissertation going to pass or not? He's the one who steps in and says, look, she did a really good job on this. You see how she's, she, saw, she highlighted this. This is what was essential. I mean, Jesus is your advocate. And the scripture tells us repeatedly, he's at the right hand of God, not only as your intercessor, but catch this, also as your advocate. Do you hear what I'm saying? This, this is awesome. This is how nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. He's your advocate, and he's also say something even more. He's your helper. Isn't that great? So he's at the right hand advocating for you, interceding for you, yes, but also advocating for you, and also sending help to you by his spirit. I'm always with you to the end of the age. He's your helper. 
okay? So this is who we're talking about. This is the son who can answer the devil. Isn't it awesome that we have, isn't it awesome that we have Jesus, our champion and our advocate and helper and mediator to, to take on the devil for us to answer? So Jesus led by the spirit. He's led by the spirit for 40 days being tested by the devil. Now, do you understand this? He's tested, he's tempted by the devil for 40 days. You hear what I'm saying? We're just getting a few highlights from Luke and Matthew about some key, you know, final rounds of, of tempting. Um, and, and during that time, Jesus ate nothing. Let, let me go ahead and take on a question that, that I sometimes get as a pastor and Bible teacher, which is like, well, yeah, Jesus, you know, prevailed at the temptation. But, I mean, obviously, he's God. He's the Son of God. It's a lot easier for Jesus than it is for somebody like me. And what I'm telling you is several things here. Number one, Jesus totally is not calling in his divine card on this. He's totally human. He has to be led by the Spirit in all of this, led by the Spirit and the Word. Secondly, uh, earlier commentators throughout the ages, and definitely C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity notes this, what's the harder test? If I go in against the heavyweight champion of the world, the heavyweight champion knocks me in the nose two seconds into the match, into the, you know, and, and I get knocked out. Somebody else goes against the heavyweight champion for 15 rounds of brutal fighting. Who was tested more? The one who remains standing. Right. All right. So let me ask you this. How many of y'all, how many of us have been tested repeatedly by the devil for 40 days and not sinned? I mean, this, this, I mean Jesus is going through it and he hasn't eaten. And we're supposed to remember this now. This is taking us back to, again, this is not five verses that I memorized from the Bible. This is knowing the Bible. Exodus 34, verse 28. Moses was there on Sinai. Remember this? with the Lord for how long? 40 days and 40 nights. We're supposed to catch this. And he, Moses, neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, which is back to Jesus and how Jesus is going to answer the devil. Okay, now let's go to Israel. Deuteronomy 8, verses 2 and 3. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God led you these 40, there's another 40, 40 years in the where? In the Garden of Eden? No, in the mitzvah, the, the wilderness, the desert. So that he, this is God testing them now. This is that, that side of the story, God testing them. So that he might humble you. So that he might humble you doing what? Testing you. To know what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, that he might make you know, verse 3, that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from God's mouth. You understand, Jesus doesn't just have a few verses he's memorized. He is going back to the issue of Adam, Moses, and Israel as he's going to answer the devil. I mean, he knows the word. And I understand he's the son of God, but this is a man, a young man who's grown in wisdom and stature and in the word of the word of the Lord you know, all this time. The son, including lowercase son, who can answer the devil. You are my son. Yes, he's the beloved, but he's also human. So the devil goes to this, obviously, famously. If you are the son of God, now, notice this. In Luke chapter 2 and Luke chapter 4, we get the first sequences of words recorded in Luke's gospel from Jesus, and they're all about Jesus' identity and relationship with and obedience to the mission of his Father. Let me repeat that. The first words that we get in Luke, back in Luke chapter 2, why, you know, don't you know your father and I have been looking for you? And Jesus responds about his relationship and his mission. Do you hear what I'm saying? At 12, he understands this. Why were you looking for me? Did you not understand I must be in my father's house about the business of my father? That's Jesus at 12. Now, second words we get from Jesus in Luke's gospel they're totally going to go to Jesus' relationship with and obedience to the covenant and to his mission for his father. 
It's how he's going to answer the devil. He doesn't get into philosophical discussions with the devil about the meaning. No, no, <laughs> don't do that. I know you think you're smart. Do not do that. Don't get into all these folks. Jesus is going to go to the covenant and to his relationship with God the Father and to the mission. So uh, Jesus' first words recorded in Luke relate to his relationship with and service to God as Father. In other words, these are the real life or death issues. This is real identity. This is like heaven and hell stuff. This is the real stuff. But also notice, in addition to this, if you are the son of God approach thing, that the devil tests and probes from multiple angles. So in the middle, we have the devil, you know, in a moment showing Jesus all the power and glory of all the empires and kingdoms of the world, of all human history. And notice, this is a temptation. So the devil actually temporarily has this power, okay? Until the second coming, the devil has this. I can give you all of this because, not because I created it, but it's been given to me. How do you think the beast rules in Revelation for that period? It's because the devil has temporary license. So he tests Jesus with this, and he says, go ahead and get it over with. You can take over the world. You can do everything. So, so different angles. Now, let's just go to the temptations a little bit more. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. In other words, your father did it for the Israelites in the desert. You can do it. Call in your divine card. Let me go back to this temptation thing. Anyone here with the power to turn a stone into bread? Anyone here have that kind of power? Jesus has the power. So hear what I'm saying again. Jesus is being tempted not only in every way you are, but far greater. You hear what I'm saying? I mean, Jesus can call in the cards if he wants to. Um, we're tempted by our own flesh, uh, by the outside world. Jesus is not tempted by that, he, but he is being tempted heavily by the devil here. Jesus says to him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. So Jesus goes to Deuteronomy, to the story of Israel in the desert. This is, this is the answer. He's submitting himself fully human to not call in his divine authority. He could call in his divine authority and eviscerate the devil right now if he wants to. He could bring in the forces of heaven. But you know what happens to your soul and mine? We're in hell forever. Jesus is not going to do that. He's your champion and your advocate, and he's going to go through this and through the cross so that you can be saved. What a man. Not only what a God, but what a man. So the devil does show him all this power and everything, and it's a temptation. Go ahead, bring on the kingdom. You know, you can take over right now. <laughs> I give it to you. I've been given this, you know. And Jesus goes to the heart, not only, you know, Deuteronomy um, 6.12, etc., but also really the heart of the thing, I think, Shema. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. This is the heart of the matter. So then the devil takes Jesus to Jerusalem. Now, Luke doesn't tell us that this is the exact sequence. I will tell you, Matthew has two and three reverse, okay? Luke just keeps saying, and. Um, Matthew says, again, pollen. So it's probably, Matthew's probably given us the sequence. Luke wants us to understand the issue is going to come down to Jerusalem. That's why he's highlighting this as the third. Because this is all the way to the cross, Gethsemane and the cross. What we just sang about. You have to understand this now. He's going to Jerusalem. How is Jesus going to play Jerusalem? He took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, you know, throw yourself down. And he quotes, twisted, like a lot of people read scripture twisted, woodenly. Well, if God says this, I have to claim this right now. Psalm 91. But Jesus goes back to Deuteronomy 6.16. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And already, we've got the Psalm 106 order of the sequencing and gradation of these temptations going on. But we also have the prophecy about what's going to happen in Luke 23. Remember, Jesus is crucified, and all the people who are basically echo chambers for the devil are saying, 
He saved others. Let him save himself. If you are the Christ, if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross right now. We've got a preview in the desert. You see what I'm saying? And the devil has already taken him to Jerusalem. This is the preview of the cross. Get yourself down from there. If you're the Christ, if you're the Son of God. And Jesus again is your Savior. He's going to go through this for you. See, Jesus, my advocate, your advocate, has already answered the devil for you. He's already given the answer. And he sympathizes, according to Hebrews 4, with our weaknesses. Isn't that awesome? He sympathizes with our weaknesses. He's able to sympathize because he's been tempted in every way we've been tempted. And in fact, beyond, not just I mean, beyond what we've been tempted. But not with the result of sin. Fully human. In the spirit and the word of God. So what do we need to do? You look to the close of those notes. You look up here on the screen. Hebrews 4 tells us. Let us then draw near. Draw near to find grace. To help in time of need. Are you struggling with the cycle of sin? Draw near to Jesus. Don't run away from him. Draw near to him. He is this one of whom we've just read. He is the one who proclaims and calls you his own. Come to him. Submit to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you because Jesus has already taken him out. This is the message of Hebrews chapter 2. Let me just read this to you as we close. This is so awesome. This is just so awesome. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death, Jesus, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. In other words, everybody who believes. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, like us in every respect. It's verse 17 of Hebrews 2. So that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. He understands you totally. Come to him and be raised up in victory. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.